Please turn with me to Luke chapter 9. So we look at verses 51 through 56, <clears throat> the essence of mercy. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? even as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, open up our hearts and our minds. that each person receive the truth of the Word of God. Lord, that you challenge us, that you encourage us, and that you change us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Give us freedom to preach this day. In the name of Jesus Christ we ask. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want to see any hands raised, okay? This is not a rhetorical question. It's serious. But I don't want to embarrass anybody, so don't raise your hand. How many have learned anything about Jesus in the last year. How many have learned anything about Jesus as compared to 20 years ago? This is an important question because in the text today we're going to see that uh, the apostles needed to learn many things. How many knew that? You can raise your hand. How many knew the apostles need to learn many things? Yeah, you know, they're people. I know you see pictures of the apostles in different paintings and such like that. You'll see halos around their head and everything like that. That's an artist's rendition. Don't believe it. You know, uh, they're people like you. They're people like me called, obviously, to a special function and purpose. But they had much to learn. You know, the time we're entering into today in the text of the Gospel of Luke, as we've been going through this Gospel verse by verse, we're at the point now where Jesus' ministry is going to go through transition. And the reason his ministry is going to go through transition is because within the year to come, he's going to be leaving. And his objective now turns to training his apostles in things that they need to know. And in light of what we've just read and what we're going to speak about today, I want you to know the end of this story. And I know it's probably not always a good idea to tell the end of the story at the beginning of the sermon. But I never have been one to follow 
too much protocol. You know, uh, John the Apostle, who is one of those who asked Jesus if it would be all right if he called down fire and incinerate the Samaritans, he would learn something from this experience. Because when you get into the later years of John, you learn that he was known as the apostle of love. The apostle of love. You say, wow, what happened to him? How do you go from wanting to incinerate somebody to being an apostle of love? Well, I'm going to tell you how you go from there. You learn Jesus. And I know, and I'm going to put the challenge out there. Here it comes. You ready? Everybody ready for a challenge? The apostles had the advantage of walking personally with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. Okay? What's our advantage? We get to walk with Jesus Christ our entire life through the Bible. Amen? I hope you acknowledge that. In the same way that they got to experience Jesus firsthand in person, we get to experience Jesus Christ firsthand through the Word of God. And you know what? We get the privilege of learning the same lessons they did. Think about it. In case you haven't figured it out, This lesson has to do with mercy and being mercy givers. It has everything to do with this fact that Jesus, when he came the first time to this earth, came for the purpose of giving mercy. That's what we're going to see in the sermon today. Look at verse 51, this transition in the ministry of Christ. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Remember this as we go through this text. Mercy is at the heart of Christ's mission. Mercy. So he turns his face toward Jerusalem Notice it says, because it was now nearing the time that he should be received up. The time was come that he should be received up. What does that mean? It speaks of a predetermined time set by God the Father, known by Jesus Christ the Son. Jesus knew It was drawing near. The time that he would be received up. Take away any confusion about what that means. Analepsis in the Greek means his ascension. The time he would depart this world. And go to sit at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. To make intercession for us. His exodus. And this is quite interesting when we recognize the entire context of Luke chapter 9. Back in verse 31, Moses and Elijah had appeared with Jesus at the transfiguration. And what were they discussing? His departure. The Greek word is easy to understand. It's the Greek word exodus. That means you're leaving. You're exiting. I want everybody to know that Jesus anticipated, he anticipated his return to heaven, wouldn't you? Are we anticipating our going to heaven? We better be. Jesus anticipated his return to heaven. John 17, 5. 
Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which with I had before the world was. That glory I had with you. That's what he wanted. And that was part of what Hebrews 12, 2 calls the joy that was set before Jesus. The joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him to endure the cross, despise the shame. Now he sits on the right hand of God. And because of that, he's been given a name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, Jesus looked ahead to heavenly glory. Even though he knew that he must suffer the humiliation and the agony of the cross. And I want to tell you this, Jesus saw past the cross. Jesus saw past the cross. And he knew what was in the future. Do we? You know, uh, Christ taught also in Luke 9, verse 23 and 24, that to be a follower of Christ, we must deny ourselves, take up the cross daily, and follow him. You know how you do that? You look past the cross. You look past the trials of this life. Amen? You're free to say that, really. Amen. Amen. You look past the cross, you see the glory of heaven. You look past the suffering, the trials, the tribulation, you see Jesus. Praise God. So Jesus looked ahead. I want everybody to recognize, too, Christ operated on a divine time schedule. He knew the day for his departure was nearing. He knew that the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption was drawing near. And as I said, this is a time of great transition in his ministry. The transition has to do with the fact that not too long down the road, Christ is no longer going to be here in body, in person. And these apostles that he's been working with and training still have a lot to learn. Remember that last week in verses 46 through 50, we just taught about how Christ gave a lesson on pride. Everybody remember that? They have a lot to learn. His Galilean ministry is now mostly ended. He'd already told his apostles that he would suffer at the hands of Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. And the apostles had to understand the importance of his impending death. So from this point on, Jesus will focus his attention on teaching these men. It's not that there's not going to be others around him. You're going to see that. But he's going to really pour in to his apostles. So he sets his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. And what awaited him there? He revealed the resolve to go through the suffering because he came to fulfill a ministry of mercy. Mercy required the cross. Jude one twenty one called it the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And we're going to learn from the text today that something else the apostles needed to learn was mercy. Mercy. 
Before we get to that, though, there are a few other things I want to cover. The expression, he, set, he steadfastly set his face, also carries the tone of judgment. Of judgment. I want to explain that. It reminds us of the teachings, the ministry of the prophet Ezekiel. It's interesting to note this, that just as Jesus is known as the Son of Man, Ezekiel is known as the Son of Man. Different way, obviously. Jesus is known as the Son of Man because he is supernaturally born. He's God who became flesh, therefore his title, Son of Man. But Ezekiel was known as the Son of Man. And Ezekiel was told by God to set his face toward different things in judgment. For instance, Ezekiel 6 2. Son of Man. Set their face, face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. I want you to notice the parallel. In Matthew 23, verse 38, Jesus set his face against Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. And he prophesied the desolation of Jerusalem. Because of the Jewish rejection of the Christ. In Ezekiel 13, 17. Ezekiel set his face against the false prophets. In Matthew 23, verse 13 through 33. Christ set his face against the false prophets of Israel. And he pronounced eight judgments upon them. Matthew 23, verse 13 through 33. Ezekiel 14, 8. Ezekiel set his face against those who worshipped idols. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus sets his face against those who worship idols. Ezekiel 15, 7. Ezekiel set his face against Jerusalem. Against Jerusalem. In Luke 21, verse 5 and 6, Jesus prophesied against Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 21, 2, Ezekiel was told to set his face against Jerusalem and the land of Israel. In Matthew 24, verse 15 through 21, Jesus set his face and prophesied against Jerusalem in the land of Israel. There's parallel here. On one hand, there's mercy. On the other hand, there's impending judgment if mercy is refused. Because Jesus is God in the flesh and he came to do God's bidding. Jesus also set his face to go to Jerusalem because he was a prophet. Let me clarify what I mean by the fact that he was a prophet. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 19, Moses prophesied of the great prophet to come. The one whom, in verse 19, everyone will one day give account. And Jesus himself stated in Luke 13, verse 33, it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. The Jews were known to murder their prophets. How many were aware of that? The Jews were known to murder their prophets. Why did they murder their prophets? Well, it goes kind of like this. They didn't like what they preached. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> they didn't like what they, what they preached, so they got rid of them. Seriously. 
you know, I'm just going to give you a few examples. There are, there are many, many more than this. But Isaiah uh, was sawn in two by King Manasseh in Manasseh's rebellion against God. Jewish history records this. Uh, Jeremiah was murdered when they took him to Egypt. Oh, yeah, and Jeremiah preached for 42 years, and nobody listened to anything he had to say. Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, was murdered by King Josiah. Yeah, it was one of those things that the Jewish people were known for. They murdered their prophets. And so Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem because he knew he had to die there. He literally said so in Luke 13, 33. Jesus also set his face to go to Jerusalem because that was the place where the Passover lambs had to be sacrificed. I say these things because Christ's life, his ministry was according to divine plan. He was totally aware of, he was totally conscious Luke 9.22, he told his apostles, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Luke 9.27, he knew there were some who were standing there who would not see death until they saw the kingdom of God coming. They would be the ones that participated in the witnessing of the transfiguration of Jesus. Luke 9, verse 30 and 31. Moses and Elijah were talking to Christ about his impending death. Luke 22, verse 22. He knew it was predetermined. Truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. Luke 12, 50. He knew he had a baptism to be baptized with. And he said, how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Jesus wanted it to be done. John 17, 4. He was fully determined to accomplish the work which the Father had given him to do. He was on a mission of mercy. Mission of mercy. Notice in verse 52. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. They did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem, showing something very important here. The Samaritans were outcasts of society. Showing that Jesus offers mercy to those who are outcasts. As they are leaving Galilee, heading down toward Jerusalem, they had a choice. You get there more expediently by passing through Samaria. Or... You could cross the Jordan River in Galilee, walk down the other side of the Jordan in order to miss going through Samaria, and then cross the Jordan again to get into Judea on their way to Jerusalem. They went through Galilee. They went from Galilee, I'm sorry, through Samaria to go to Jerusalem. That's how they went. And I want you to see Jesus went far past the social boundaries. That should not surprise us. Given the ministry of Christ, he always associated with the outcasts. You will see him with tax collectors. You will see him with lepers. 
demon-possessed, people who are ill. He shattered the stereotypes of ministry. And according to Matthew 23, 23, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, paid no attention to mercy. Jesus broke the conventional stereotypes of religion. I want you to know something. He had to teach his apostles to do the same thing. That's what this is all about, this entire sermon. Jesus did that. He needed to teach his apostles. Now I want to make some comments about the Samaritans. This is very important. Jewish people in that day, because of the Jewish leaders mostly, they had no love for Samaritans. They had no mercy for Samaritans. In fact, there were some Jews traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem who had not walked through Samaria to get there. Rather, they would cross the Jordan. They'd walk down the other side of the river. Then they'd cross the Jordan again to get back to where Jerusalem is. And there is evidence to show that some Jewish people actually did walk through Samaria, but they carried their own food with them because they weren't going to eat that dirty, filthy, lousy Samaritan food. Uh, from Josephus, we learned the great hostility that existed from the Samaritans toward the Jew, too. Josephus was a first century uh, hist historian, a Jew, and he writes about these things. But I want everybody to recognize how Jesus broke ministerial stereotypes. What did he do in John 4.4? 4? Well, he was going from Galilee down to Judea, and it says he must needs go through Samaria. Uh, why did he have to go through Samaria? Well, there was a divine appointment awaiting him at the well of Samaria in the person of the woman at the well. And Jesus had an appointment to keep. And he knew it. Jesus also rebuked the hatred toward the Samaritans in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, and he uses Jewish leaders as an example of what not to do. In that parable in Luke 10, there was two Jewish leaders they were going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And they passed by a man that had been beaten half to death. They passed by him. Showing they were unconcerned, uncaring, not merciful at all. Then who came down the road? A Samaritan. The Samaritan helped the man. He was the neighbor to the man. Jesus had taught that you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And literally, he's teaching that Samaria is included in God's plan of redemption. Consider in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, as Jesus is preparing to ascend to heaven, he commissioned the gospel to go to Samaria. Along with Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. He taught that it's easy to show mercy to those you love and are comfortable with. But in Matthew 5.44, he taught, love your enemies. 
That breaks the stereotype. Love your enemies. Do good unto them. Bless them. Pray for them. In going to Samaria, Jesus went to outcasts. They weren't just ordinary, as you would say, outcasts. They distorted scripture. They misrepresented God. They worshipped idols. And he went to the most despised and he showed mercy. Who were the Samaritans? We learned this back in 2 Kings 17, verse 24 through 41. At the time of the Assyrian captivity, about 700 B.C., which would make it seven centuries before Christ, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, known as Samaria. And that king moved in foreign people into that land of Samaria. He took Samaritans, the Jewish people, and moved them elsewhere. That was their practice because the king thought it would be easier to rule over a people that were unfamiliar with the surroundings. What happened? The Jewish people that were left in Samaria intermarried with the pagans. They were moved from elsewhere and they became known as half-breeds. And what happened over the course of time, those people, now known as Samaritans, worshipped the God of Israel, and they worshipped the pagan gods from their own land. And they developed a hybrid kind of religion. That was a great part of the animosity between Jews and the Samaritans. In Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, when the Jews returned from the southern kingdom of Judea, when they returned from Babylonian captivity, they came back to rebuild the temple. Samaritan people offered help in rebuilding that temple. And the Jewish people refused the help. Animosity. The Jews were very upset with the Samaritans that they built a temple of their own. They built a temple of their own to worship in on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And it was a Jew by the name of John Hyrcanus who destroyed that temple. Well, that caused quite a bit of animosity too. A lot of hostility. Josephus tells us that frequently Jews who were going from Galilee down to Jerusalem and they pass through Samaria to go to a religious festival, they were not received by the Samaritans. That's what happened here. Jesus is going from Galilee through Samaria down to Jerusalem, and they won't receive him because his face is set to go to Jerusalem. To a Samaritan, if that was a slap in the face. That's like saying, I can't worship with you. I can't worship at your temple. There's a temple in Jerusalem I'm going to. But, you know, we're not going to stay here and worship with you. We're just passing through. Passing through. And so that you know, 
when Jesus confronted, or I should say encountered, the woman at the well, in John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, that discourse that he had with her about worshiping God in spirit and truth was a rebuke against Samaritan practices. Worshiping in a false temple, worshiping a false god. Jesus said the Father desires those who worship him to worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice in verse 54, the apostles' reaction. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, saw that Christ was refused, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elisha did? A little word on James and John. They were originally fishermen. They were among some of Christ's earliest disciples. They were also in his inner circle, along with the apostle Peter. And in Mark 3.17, we learned that Jesus called them sons of thunder. If you're wondering what sons of thunder mean, that means they were loud, arrogant, and boisterous. That's what it means. They were so boisterous that Jesus named them the sons of thunder. Sons of thunder. You know, they wanted to take revenge on the Samaritans, just like Elijah took revenge on the Samaritans. I got to tell you this story, and it comes from 2 Kings chapter 1. There was a wicked king named King Ahaziah, and Ahaziah was guilty of idol worship. He was also guilty of following in the steps of King Ahab, who followed in the steps of his father, King Omri, in leading the nation of Israel into idolatry, idolatry. And this is what the king said to his messengers one day when he got sick. Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness or die. So he sent messages, messengers to inquire of this pagan god. Elijah intercepted them. And Elijah told the messengers, the king is going to surely die. In verses 9 and 10, the king sent 50 soldiers to go and apprehend Elijah. He either didn't like the message or he wanted a face-to-face -face with this prophet. Uh, the king sent 50 messengers to Elijah and the messenger, the captain, referred to Elijah as the man of God. Elijah said, well, if I'm a man of God, I'm going to call down fire on you and consume you and your 50 men. Well, God proved that he's a man of God because fire came down from heaven and consumed the 50. You know, so in verses 11 and 12, the king sends 50 more. Said, well, that didn't work. I'll try 50 other ones. Maybe that'll work. And they approach Elijah and said, oh, man of God. Elijah said, well, if I'm a man of God, I'm going to call down fire out of heaven and consume you and you're 50. And that's what happened. Well, the king says, huh, that didn't work either. I'll send 50 more. You know what they call insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again. 
even though you know it won't work. <laughs> well, this uh, captain uh, had a mind about him. And in verse 13 through 15, uh, rather than being consumed like the other 100, he said, let's negotiate. <laughs> Please have mercy on me. And Elijah was visited at that time by the angel of the Lord that told him, go with these men. They won't harm you. And Elijah went, and he pronounced judgment on the king face to face. And this is something I want to make clear. Elijah served as an instrument of God's judgment James and John must have thought they were like Elijah because they were with Jesus. They had been empowered by Christ. They had seen Elijah along with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's interesting to see this and how this transpires. And recognize that in Acts chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, John was actually sent to Samaria to do ministry. That means he learned something. He learned something. It's obvious from our text that even though the apostles were present at the Sermon on the Mount, they heard that teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They heard Jesus say in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. It's obvious that they didn't get it. There is one thing I have to say on behalf of Christ. I mean, on behalf of James and John. They obviously were very loyal to the Lord. You know, they showed their loyalty, their boldness in asking Christ to give them the permission to call fire down from heaven also tells us that they believed he would. But they were sadly mistaken. The underlying principle is this. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved Jesus said also I did not come in order to judge the world but in order to save the world in Luke's gospel chapter 19 verse 10 for the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost so while the apostles' intentions, their loyalty to Christ is clear. Jesus rebukes them. Verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Some very important things we have to notice. Jesus did not rebuke the Samaritans. How may pick that up? Jesus did not rebuke the Samaritans, even though their worship was pagan. They did not worship God in spirit and truth. He rebuked James and John because of their attitude. Elijah, as we said before, was given the authority by God to enact the wrath of God upon those people. The apostles are under the direction of Christ for the purpose of doing ministry to people who are opposed to the gospel. Elijah acted under the authority of God. 
When the disciples desired to call down fire from heaven, Jesus demonstrates that he didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Being like Jesus means being merciful to others. We remember this, that it's God himself that said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Notice what Jesus says here, you know not what manner of spirit you are. They were not being led by the spirit of God. And Jesus is preparing them for ministry for after he leaves. And there's a word here for us today. You cannot go through ministry with this attitude. When you proclaim Jesus to someone, or you introduce Christ to someone, when they don't receive him, you can't just destroy him. If their situation of not receiving Christ continues with no repentance, God will do the destroying, not us. That's up to God, not us. We are called to evangelize, not destroy. You know, you just can't have the mindset, repent or die. Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Well, Jesus gives a lesson on mercy. Mercy is compassionate, loving, and selfless. Merciless people are vengeful, hateful, and destructive. What is Christ doing? He's teaching these men, remember, they're like us. He's teaching these men God's perspective. You know what you have to do when you open the Bible and you read the Bible and there's something in there you don't like? You have to come to grips with it and say, who's right and who's wrong? And if you come to the conclusion that you're right and the Bible's wrong, you've just called God a liar. By faith, we have to understand this. I think it's important that we look at this perspective of God and recognize that right after the lesson on pride, Jesus sees an opportunity to give a lesson on mercy. You say, you mean those two go together? Well, think about it. It's the humble person who will show mercy. The humble show mercy. You might be surprised that Scripture exalts mercy just as it exalts truth. Proverbs 3.3 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them on the table of thine heart. Mercy and truth. They go together. Hosea 4.1 The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. Hosea 12, 6, Turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment. Judgment is truth. Zechariah 7, 9, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion. Every man to his brother. 
Proverbs eleven seventeen: the merciful man doeth good to his own soul. Hallelujah. That's true. But he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. James 2, 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we see Jesus came to this earth on a mission of mercy. He was sent to provide mercy for unworthy sinners. Mercy is at the very heart of God's plan of redemption. Mercy is central to the cause of Christian ministry. Jesus extends mercy to whosoever will receive him without regard to ethnicity, race, age, or gender. Micah 7, 18 is a really good verse to remember and commit it to the heart. It's short too. God delights in mercy. He delights in those who are merciful. And the challenge for us today is that we go into a world darkened by sin, that we reflect the mercy of Jesus Christ. Jesus demonstrated the love of God through his mercy toward us, did he not? Remember what life was like before you ever met Christ? Remember the road you were traveling? Take a look now. God's mercy. Jesus demonstrated the love of God that flows from his mercy. In the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us also do ministry to a sin-darkened world through the eyes of mercy by the power of Jesus Christ through the direction of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, thank you for extending mercy to those who have no merit to deserve it. We thank you that while we were your enemies, you still extended mercy we had nothing to offer you, but you showed mercy even though we are unworthy. And we who have received mercy must be merciful. Help us to extend mercy and leave judgment to you. We know that there comes a time that you come to judge, but until then extend mercy through us we pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.